Hello, hello and welcome. Give a few, a moment or two for everybody to get logged in. Uh, I see our numbers rising. While we're waiting for everybody to log in, I just wanted to um, welcome you guys to the San Diego Law Library's webinar on McGirt v. Oklahoma with our honored guest, Mark Vizola, who is a, the directing attorney of the California Indian Legal Services. Um, we are very grateful to have him. During this webinar, we have turned off the chat feature. So um, if you need to contact us, just use the Q&A. I will be monitoring the question and answer the Q&A throughout this webinar. Um, but Mark is asked that we just wait until the end for questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in as you think of them, and then we'll do a Q&A at the end of this presentation. Um, see, everybody's getting here, wonderful. So uh, just to introduce Mark, um, so, See, Mark is the directing attorney with California Indian Legal Services, as I mentioned. His practice includes estate planning for individuals under the American Indian Probate Reform Act, uh, Indian Child Welfare Advocacy, and advising Native organizations, tribal boards, committee, and committees, administering tribal elections, co-drafting and defending casino tort claims. And he currently serves as a chief judge of the Pala Tribal Court in Pala, California. Um, he graduated from University of Massachusetts Amherst with his bachelor's in history and then went to UCLA all the way on the other side, the left coast as we are here. Um, he went to UCLA for his law degree and his uh, master's in American Indian studies. Um, during law school, he clerked for the Hopi Appellate Court and interned at the U.S. Department of Justice's Office of Tribal Justice in Washington, D.C. Um, we are very happy to have him here with us today, and I'm going to turn it over to Mark and mute my video. But again, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to use the Q&A and take it away, Mark. Thank you, Valerie. Um, I just want to thank the San Diego Law Library uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about this really important and fascinating Supreme Court decision. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Valerie and Eddie behind the scenes for all the work he's doing, um, making this Zoom presentation possible. Um, my final acknowledgement is uh, for the Luceno people. Uh, so today I'm uh, coming to you from my office in Escondido. Escondido and most of Northern San Diego County is on the traditional homeland of the Luceno people. Um, several uh, Luceno tribes continue to live in the area, uh, but the uh, ancestral lands actually stretched all the way to the coast. So I just wanted to acknowledge them. So we're here today to talk about a Supreme Court case called McGirt versus Oklahoma. And it's significant for a couple of reasons. Um, for one thing, uh, it's not every term that a federal Indian law case reaches the Supreme Court and is accepted by the justices. But this happened in 2019 and we got a decision in 2020 that actually shook things up in Indian country. And Indian country is a defined term which I will talk about in a moment. Let's see. So first, I want to just give you a little bit uh, about the background of the case. Uh, it's a very serious case. It's a criminal law case. Basically, uh, Mr. McGirt, who is a Native American, uh, challenged an Oklahoma conviction of him uh, for sexual assault. He was accused uh, and eventually convicted of sexually assaulting his girlfriend's uh, minor granddaughter. And this was back in the late 1990s. So he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, in addition to 500, uh, two 500 year terms. So we're, we're talking about a heinous crime, but what is the basis of his challenge? Mr. McGirt actually claimed that his alleged crime or his crime, because he was convicted, uh, took place on the land of the Muscogee Creek Nation in Oklahoma. Now, because of federal jurisprudence and where tribes come down on criminal law, tribes continue to re retain criminal jurisdiction over Indians within their jurisdiction. 
So Mr. McGirt was making the argument that if his crimes took place on Indian land, then it would have been the tribe rather than the state of Oklahoma that had jurisdiction over him. So he was seeking to um, throw out his state court conviction. He wanted another trial in federal court. Now this presented the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma with um, an interesting decision. Um, are they going to file an amicus brief and support Mr. McGirt, who had already been convicted of doing terrible things, or would they not? Well, they chose to, to file an amicus brief, not because they wanted to defend Mr. McGirt in any way, but because he was challenging his conviction on jurisdictional grounds, the tribe saw this as an opportunity to get before the Supreme Court um, uh, a compelling argument that they still in fact had jurisdiction over this land. So we're gonna talk about how this got there and what the Supreme Court ruled. Basically, once you boil down all the interesting facts and arguments of this case, it comes down to one uh, question. Is this, and by this, I'm talking about this little, um, well, not so little area of the state of Oklahoma which is in the eastern part of the state and includes the big city of Tulsa, is this area still Indian country? That was the decision before the United States Supreme Court. And if the court found it was in fact Indian country, that would mean that Oklahoma did not have jurisdiction over Mr. McGirt because he was an Indian who was charged, in, charged with a crime in Indian country. That means that he was under the tribe's jurisdiction and not the state's. By the way, I think if you were to ask anybody, except maybe the tribe, um, up until 2019, who has criminal jurisdiction in the state of Oklahoma? Most people would have said the state. Uh, the reason for that is because um, while there are many Indian tribes in the state of Oklahoma today, and we'll talk a little bit about how that happened, um, it was thought that there were no longer any Indian reservations in the state. Therefore, the only gov government with jurisdiction over crimes would be the state of Oklahoma, or in some cases, the federal government. So, when is land Indian country? And remember, that is the main issue before the Supreme Court in this case. Well, we actually have a federal statute that tells us what is Indian country. Basically, there are three types of Indian country. All land within the limits of an Indian reservation, all dependent Indian communities, and Indian communities are lands that have been set aside for tribes by the federal government and remain under federal superintendents. So probably the most well-known example of a dependent Indian community are the Pueblos of New Mexico. The third type of Indian country um, are allotments. So over uh, the course of about, mm, I would say, 60 to 70 years or so between the mid uh, 1850s and the late 1920s. Um, the United States government, um, in order to promote assimilation among uh, Native American people, started to carve up Indian reservations and allot uh, individual pieces of land to individual Native Americans. The idea was um, that private land ownership would get these Native American people used to living under state and local laws. Um, like I said, it was part of the assimilation process, which the United States government was actually pretty candid about um, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, but the assimilation um, never went into effect. There are 574 federally recognized tribes um, in existence today in the United States. The number keeps growing and the tribes uh, have, I think, done a very good job of retaining, getting back their culture and expanding their sovereignty. 
So these are the three types of uh, Indian countries that could exist. Now, this is a very busy slide. Normally, uh, I wouldn't put so much information into one slide, um, but I just wanted um, attendees to see kind of the progression um, of Muscogee Creek uh, history in the state of Oklahoma. In fact, I wanna go back uh, to uh, a bit earlier than 1833. Um, the Muscogee Creeks, along with the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Cherokee, and even some Seminole people uh, were forcibly removed from their homelands in the southeastern part of the United States to what is today Oklahoma. And this began in the 1820s and the 1830s. The reason for this, plain and simple, was that so many other people, including the states and the federal government, wanted Indian land in that region. It contained very fertile soil. There were rumors that it contained gold. And we knew about North America at this time that there was a lot of open space out in the West. It was considered the Great American Desert and the United States government and the states of Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, um, and some others thought that they could do an even swap with the, the local tribes and just give them the same amount of land out there where they would be out of the way of progress. And these are tribes who had actually been nicknamed the five civilized tribes because they had um, many English speaking members. They had adopted a very Western style government, including constitutions, Congresses, and a court system. Um, but even all of those things was not enough to um, uh, convince the powers that be uh, that the tribe should be able to stay on their ancestral lands. So starting um, in the early 1830s, we have the Trail of Tears. Um, that trail refers to the journey from the southeast to what is present day Oklahoma. Um, and it was a journey made by many members of those five tribes. Um, and it was a journey that none of them will forget because they lost probably about 25% of their population along the way. Um, the move actually began in October and it wasn't complete until March. So the government picked some very cold months to move tens of thousands of people over a thousand miles from their homeland. But when you go into the 19th century, you can see with the Curtis Act of 1898 that Congress actually abolished the Creek Nation tribal courts. The Creek, uh, the Creek lands were also allotted beginning in 1906 under an allotment agreement. Um, just a year later, or actually in the same year, um, Congress restricted the authority of the Creek Nation um, to, um, <clears throat> to act in certain ways that any sovereign government would, but allowed it to reta retain certain elements of a tribal government. I know that sounds kind of wishy-washy, but that's the way the law was at the time. And then in 1907, Oklahoma becomes a state, which actually makes or made the Creek Nation's chances for um, sovereign survival uh, even smaller. You can actually see on this timeline a pattern where the Creek Nation was divested of a lot of its power. So this is going to give the state of Oklahoma the impression that you know, the Creek government doesn't have much power at all. Now, most of the government seems to be uh, in the hands of the state itself. And that's really what the McGirt decision is all about. It was only in the 1930s when we had a new administration in the White House, Franklin Roosevelt, um, that we had a new commitment to Indian affairs. And we, we start to see the federal government supporting and strengthening tribal governments instead of trying to assimilate them. Um, this program of uh, self-determination was far from perfect, but it was a step in the right direction. So we have the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act of 1936 that actually 
said it was okay for tribes to develop their own constitutional governments. Um, now, I would say, and I think most of my clients would agree that the tribes always had that power because they have inherent sovereignty. But now we see um, a state law actually um, giving its blessing to constitutional tribal governments. And then it wasn't until 1979 that the Muscogee Creek Nation actually established its own constitution under that Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act. So it's been a very diverse history for the Muscogee Creek Nation. And I would say also for the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw and Seminole nations as well. Some of whom um, exist in multiple sovereign governments. For example, there are two Cherokee tribal governments in the state of Oklahoma and one in North Carolina. There is a Seminole tribe in Florida as well as one today in Oklahoma. So this is all as a result of the Trail of Tears and the government's assimilationist policies. Uh, but that is what brings us to the McGirt decision. This issue itself was not new. The Supreme Court had addressed it um, about four years earlier in a case called Nebraska versus Parker. And the Supreme Court gave us a test. And those of you uh, who are attorneys on this, uh, on this Zoom presentation, you probably like tests as much as I do because when a court gives us a test, it gives us something to go off of. Um, in our line of work, so many things are fact dependent. But when we have a test, we can work through the elements of each test and kind of uh, present the court with that analysis. So what the Supreme Court told us in Nebraska versus Parker was that in order to determine whether or not land is still Indian country, whether it is still an Indian reservation, you have to look at three things. The first thing is the language of the statute. Is there actually something on point that disestablished a reservation and said it no longer exists? Then you have to look at contemporaneous history. What has been going on with this tribe and with this state? And how has this land been used or how is it being used? And then you look at subsequent history, including demographics. And I think what the Supreme Court meant by demographics is who is living on this land? Is this land occupied by Native Americans or by members of this particular tribe? Or is it mostly occupied by non-Indians? Does that make a difference? Um, and it's probably not surprising that the Supreme Court um, came down the Supreme Court justices came down differently on these prongs of the test. So in McGirt, um, and I think in Parker as well, Solemn was an earlier case that actually predated uh, Parker uh, versus Nebraska. Um, the majority, the Supreme Court's majority focused on the language of the statute. And this is what we're going to see come out in the McGirt decision. Um, the contemporaneous history and subsequent history and demographic prongs, those are lower or of less importance than the language of the statute, at least according to the current um, makeup of the Supreme Court. Um, so this list one, two, and three is actually an order of importance. That's what the Supreme Court is telling us. I'm going to cut right to the chase and give you the holding, but then we're going to unpack it and we're going to talk about um, the state of Oklahoma's arguments and how the Supreme Court responded to each one. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what this means for Indian country, for members of the Muscogee Creek Nation, and also for other Indians who might have been convicted of crimes that took place on their land. The holding came down um, in a 5-4 decision with um, Justice Neil Gorsuch writing the majority opinion. Uh, Justice Gorsuch uh, was a President Trump appointee. He came from the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals um, right out of Colorado. 
And it's kind of significant because out of all of the justices on the Supreme Court, certainly the newer justices like uh, Amy Coney Barrett and Brett Kavanaugh, Justice Gorsuch probably arrived at the Supreme Court with more Indian law experience than other justices because he just had a lot more Indian law cases on the Tenth Circuit. So um, I was not very surprised when I found out that he wrote this opinion, um, which I thought was a very well-reasoned and well-written opinion um, that we're gonna go through together. But this is the gist of the court's ruling. Basically, Congress does have the power to disestablish an Indian reservation. Congress also has the power to establish an Indian reservation it gets that power from Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution. The Indian Commerce Clause grants to Congress the power to regulate commerce with Indian tribes. And that's what it's doing when it creates or disestablishes an Indian reservation. Um, but when it does so, or if it does so, Congress must do so expressly. It can't be vague and it cannot be implied. Next, as a result of that first part of the decision, the Supreme Court tells us that the state of Oklahoma has no jurisdictional or prosecutorial power over Indians who commit crimes um, on Indian land. And now we know because of the Supreme Court's decision that that chunk that I showed you in the earlier slide remains Indian country. That means that the tribe continues to have criminal jurisdiction over Indians who commit crimes within that area. Finally, criminal jurisdiction over Indians in this area is up to the tribe and the federal government. Um, we could probably have a separate presentation on jurisdiction, but suffice it to say that tribes, states, and the federal government um, are all separate sovereigns. Therefore, there is no double jeopardy issue when it comes to prosecuting somebody for the same crime. A tribe can prosecute someone along with the federal government um, or with the state. It depends on what state that the tribe is located in. It depends on where the crime took place. Um, but there is no double jeopardy problem there. Um, in California, um, we don't have to worry about this particular uh, issue because California is what we call a public law 280 state. So starting about 70 years ago, Congress gave criminal jurisdiction over people on Indian lands, including Indians, to the state of California and a handful of other states. So when we're talking about crimes committed in California on Indian land, it's really up to the state of California and the tribal governments to decide whether or not they want to prosecute the, uh, a person for that crime. None of the tribes I work with in Southern California are currently exercising criminal jurisdiction. They have that power, um, but in order to do so, they would have to uh, spend a lot of money um, on ensuring the due process rights of non-Indians and Indians alike, hiring public defenders, prosecutors, um, things like that. So this is the holding of the McGirt decision in a nutshell. But like I said, I wanna unpack this even more and I wanna go through what the Supreme Court said in response to each of the arguments I don't want to make light of Oklahoma's position, but you know, in terms of spaghetti and walls, Oklahoma threw everything at the wall in this case. I don't know if that's because they thought they had a really good case. Why not make all of these arguments and see what stuck? Or if it's because maybe they didn't even really think they had a strong case and they were kind of desperate. I'm not sure, but there are a number of arguments and we're going to look at each one one at a time. Oklahoma's first argument was that Congress ended the Creek Nation's claim to the land during the allotment era of the 19th century. So we talked about this in the timeline slide that um, Congress had actually started allotting 
the Creek Nation land among individual Creek members. And this happened with a lot of tribes, but the Supreme Court wasn't buying it. Uh, Justice, Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch said that, you know, after looking at these statutes that allotted Muscogee Creek land, um, there was no language that actually gave up or surrendered Creek land. It was still in tribal hands, so to speak. And there was nothing in those statutes that said that the actual reservation had been disestablished. Because you can have allotments that are within or outside of an Indian reservation. So an allotment statute by itself does not mean that a reservation ceases to exist unless it actually says so. The next argument Oklahoma made was that the federal government, because it abolished Creek tribal courts in the 1890s and required the Creek nation to get approval to adopt certain laws, meant that it really did away with the tribal government as everybody knew it. Well, the Supreme Court didn't agree with that argument either. It said that those statutes, while they devastated the tribe's government system, did actually not eliminate the tribe's interest in the land. Again, uh, going back to the Parker case that I referenced a moment ago, the Supreme Court seems to be looking for language that unequivocally says the Muscogee Creek Nation's reservation was disestablished. And so far, it's not finding that language. Next argument from Oklahoma. Congress never really established a reservation in the first place, um, but rather a dependent Indian community, which as we said earlier, um, still constitutes Indian country under federal law. A dependent Indian community is the second uh, type of Indian country under that statute 1151. The Supreme Court doesn't buy this either. Um, it went back and looked at the original treaty language that brought the Muscogee Creek Nation to what is today Oklahoma and said that you know, it was very clear that Congress intended to create a reservation for the Muscogee Creek Nation, despite not using the word reservation. So Justice Gorsuch was very thorough in this opinion. He went back and looked at all of these statutes. He looked at the treaty from the 19th century. He didn't see the word reservation, but you know, based on everything that those statutes and that treaty did, it was very clear to the majority that this was intended to be a reservation. And the allotment statutes that we see coming out of the 1890s and early 1900s didn't expressly disestablish the reservation. So there's a lot of um, nuanced language being examined in this decision. Um, and you know, if you have interest in um, Federal Indian law, Native American history, I encourage you to read the entire opinion. It was um, very interesting, very interesting. And we're still not done. Oklahoma uh, then claims that the potential fallout of finding that this reservation is still intact could disrupt so many criminal convictions that it would hamper the state's ability to prosecute people. So this is a different kind of argument. It's not going back to the law. It's saying, look at the possible ramifications of finding that the reservation is still intact. This could really mess up our system of criminal justice in Oklahoma. Well, the Supreme Court isn't looking at that. Um, that's kind of a hypothetical argument in the first place, and it's trying to stick to the language. So the Supreme Court responds, if Congress wishes to withdraw its promises from the Muscogee Creek na uh, Nation, it can do so, but it has to say so. And so far, the Supreme Court isn't finding it. Finally, um, I think finally, there might be one, oh, there is one more, two more points Oklahoma raises before the high court. It says that its own enabling act transferred tribal court cases to state courts, which is true. We already talked about um, 
a statute that uh, began phasing out tribal court uh, jurisdiction and transferring those cases to state courts. So Oklahoma is trying to uh, make an argument that, you know, if you follow this inference, it's just slowly taking away power and authority from the Muscogee Creek Nation. So logically, you couldn't or wouldn't imagine that the tribe would continue to have a reservation if it doesn't even have the power to pass its own laws or exercise um, judicial jurisdiction over its people. But you know, the Supreme Court has an answer for that too. It looks at a law called the Major Crimes Act of 1885, and it says, well, you know, the United States government had previously transferred criminal jurisdiction over Indians to federal courts. Um, so Public Law 280, which I mentioned to you um, a little while ago, was passed by Congress in 1953 that amended the Major Crimes Act by transferring that federal jurisdiction over Indians um, from federal court to state courts. And California happens to be one of those state courts um, that acquired criminal jurisdiction over Indians for crimes committed on Indian land. And Public Law 280 is still in effect today. Um, but basically, Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch was telling us that, you know, just the simple act of transferring jurisdiction from a tribal court to a state court by itself does not disestablish a reservation because that's happened before in other situations, like with the Major Crimes Act. Finally, the last argument uh, or piece of spaghetti that Oklahoma throws at the wall is that, look, we've been prosecuting Indians in state courts for generations for serious crimes. And we've been doing that because white settlement, um, the influx of non-native people into the state of Oklahoma uh, required us to do that. So now we have more non-native people living on these lands than we have native people. So naturally, Oklahoma has an interest in protecting its citizens and exercising criminal jurisdiction over them. The Supreme Court won't go for that either. It says that, you know, there are actually hundreds of agreements in place between Oklahoma tribes in the states that regulate everything from taxes to vehicle registration. So just the simple fact that Oklahoma has been exercising criminal jurisdiction over these Indians for a long time does not make it right, okay? The tribe and the tribes and the states can figure out other ways to, to deal with this situation. But the fact that Oklahoma has been exercising jurisdiction that legally it didn't have all along, that fact by itself does not mean it's okay. And it didn't kind of grandfather in this criminal jurisdiction um, to the state of Oklahoma. Naturally, there was a dissent, um, a pretty powerful dissent from four justices, Chief Justice John Roberts, who was joined by Justices Alito, uh, Thomas, and uh, Kavanaugh. Um, <clears throat> this wasn't a huge surprise. Um, I don't know that anybody has carefully examined his voting record. I'm sure they have. Um, but Chief Justice John Roberts seems more like a swing boat on Indian law issues than most of the other justices, at least more so than Kavanaugh, Alito, and Thomas. Um, and in this case, he happened to go against the majority. Um, their reasoning uh, seemed to be that, you know, the reservation was not disestablished or could not be disestablished because doing so would create a significant uncertainty for the state's authority um, over areas of the law that touch on Indian affairs, everything from zoning to uh, taxation to family and environmental law. Um, I think if you distill the dissent's position, it comes down to this would create chaos. If we find that that reservation 
is still, in essence, in existence and was not disestablished, it would wreak havoc on the judicial systems of not only the state of Oklahoma, but also the tribe or tribes, plural. Uh, because remember, even though this case focuses on the land of the Muscogee Creek Nation, we're talking about multiple other tribes who have very similar histories, the Seminole, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Cherokee. Um, so this could set a precedent for, for cases come out, coming out of other parts of Oklahoma. Um, but the majority obviously carried the day with a 5-4 vote. Now, the reaction to the McGirt decision, at least in, in my circles, among people who you know, follow federal Indian law and major news sources, was significant and generally positive, rightfully so. This was a big deal. There are not many federal Indian law cases that go up to the United States Supreme Court. But over the last seven or eight years, we have seen a couple of biggies. Um, that have dealt with everything from Indian child welfare to tribal sovereign immunity uh, to now whether or not um, Indian reservations were disestablished. And then, of course, the jurisdiction over those uh, tribal lands. So the New York Times actually described this as potentially one of the most consequential legal victories for Native Americans in decades. And I don't think that is an overstatement. Um, I would agree that's uh, a very big deal for tribes across the country. Um, and then the Native American Rights Fund, which is a uh, nonprofit based in Boulder, Colorado, that advocates on behalf of tribes and Native American individuals all across the country, um, said that in holding the federal government to its treaty obligations, the court put to rest what never should have been a question. As we know, 5-4 decision or 5-4 to four decision, uh, the Supreme Court found no language disestablishing the Muscogee Creek Nation's reservation. Therefore, it still exists. And therefore, the tribe continues to have criminal jurisdiction over Indians who commit crimes within those boundaries. Now, I have a, a couple of quotes I, I want to share with you. And of course, if you have read the decision, you've, you've seen these, or you've seen this language. Um, the first one is pretty lengthy, but I just couldn't find a good place to cut it down. So I just put the whole thing on this one slide. Um, and I know you can read along, but I just want to read it to you because um, I think it's well written, well reasoned, and it really gets to the heart of this case. Um, and it's really addressing a number of Oklahoma's arguments. This is directly um, right off the right out of uh, Justice Gorsuch's pen. How much easier it would be after all to let the state proceed as it always assumed it might. But just imagine what it would mean to indulge in that path. A state exercises jurisdiction over Native Americans with such persistence that the practice seems normal. Indian landowners lose their titles by fraud or otherwise in sufficient volume that no one remembers whose land it once was. All this continues for long enough that a reservation that once was beyond doubt becomes questionable and then, or even then, far-fetched. Sprinkle in a few predictions here, some contestable commentary there, and the job is done. A reservation is disestablished. None of these moves would be permitted in any other area of statutory interpretation, and there is no reason why they should be permitted here. That would be the rule of the strong, not the rule of the law. So, my interpretation or translation of that quote is just because Oklahoma has been doing things the same way for a long time doesn't mean they've been doing them the right way. And then finally, um, <clears throat> promises were made, but the price of keeping them has become too great, so we should just cast a blind eye. Unlawful acts are never enough to amend the law. 
Okay, so the Supreme Court is really trying to enforce and uphold the federal government's promises to the Creek Nation going back to 1833 and beyond. Um, and basically telling the state of Oklahoma that maybe just because you tried to phase out tribal sovereignty, um, even with the support and the help of the federal government, the tribe continues to exist and their land, their reservation land was never disestablished. Um, and the court reached that conclusion, as I said, by looking at these statutes, by looking at the treaty language and finding no definitive evidence or express language uh, disestablishing the Muscogee Creek Nation's reservation. Now, I, I don't uh, wanna muck up the waters, but this is a, um, a chart that might be helpful in understanding criminal law in Indian country and post McGirt. Um, so you have to, you have to consider a couple of factors. You have to consider where the uh, crime took place. Did it take place in Indian country? Who was the victim? Who was the perpetrator? And, you know, we live in a country where I think most people believe or want to believe that justice should be blind when it comes to race. We know that doesn't always happen. And we can see that playing out in Minnesota. Um, over the last few weeks, including with the most recent police shooting that took place over this weekend. But what I think a lot of people don't realize is that you do have to ask the question, are you Indian, um, when talking to a perpetrator in Indian country? Because the answer to that question will dictate who or which government has jurisdiction over that individual. Now, Indian is not really a, race, a racial classification in this context. It's a political one um, because it's like dual citizenship. Are you a member of the Seminole tribe of Oklahoma or are you enrolled with the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma? Um, because if you are, then the tribe might have jurisdiction over you if your crime was committed in Indian country. Um, so I will just uh, let you let you peruse that chart. Um, I think it's helpful because as you can see, um, depending on who you are, where you are, and even the crime itself, uh, it could be subject to tribal, state, and or federal criminal jurisdiction. And again, we go back to that, that idea that because these are all separate sovereigns, um, there aren't double jeopardy concerns here. A person could be um, tried for the same crime in a tribal court as well as a federal court. There are limits on the punishments uh, a tribal court can hand out to convicted criminals. They are limited in terms of fees and also jail time, but they can be stacked, they can add up. Um, and of course, uh, you know, I think given the choice, uh, most people would want to reduce, if not eliminate, any criminal convictions. Um, but it is possible that a person could face a criminal trial for the same crime in multiple courts. Finally, um, the fallout uh, from this decision. And I could have gone on and on on slides, but I realized that we only had an hour together today. So I wanted to limit it with what I thought were some of the more interesting developments to come out of this case. Technically, Mr. McGirt won. He challenged his Oklahoma conviction successfully. Now, you know, the tribe was not defending Mr. McGirt in any way, shape, or form. And given what we know about him, I mean, if he certainly had a right to a, free, a fair trial. Um, but this was not an individual a lot of people would have been rooting for. But what happened was, as soon as this decision came out, the federal government took over and prosecuted him under federal law, and he was convicted. Uh, the same is true for another uh, a number of other um, Native Americans who are currently behind bars. There was no mass exodus or release 
from prison for these people. I want to be very clear about that. Um, but a number of other um, inmates have successfully challenged their state court convictions. And they've had an opportunity to get new trials either in tribal or federal court. Um, now the Oklahoma Attorney General is trying to work out an agreement, which is what he calls it, um, that would give jurisdiction um, over non-Indians uh, for all acts, including crimes committed in Indian country to the state of Oklahoma. Um, some tribes are on board with this and some tribes are not. Like I said, it's very expensive to exercise criminal jurisdiction um, in tribal court. It can be done. The tribes certainly have um, the inherent sovereign powers to do so. But in order to afford defendants uh, their due process rights um, to provide a public defender to hire prosecutors, especially when the volume of cases seems to be growing, which it has in Oklahoma over the last six or seven months, um, is sometimes cost prohibitive. So there are some tribes that are okay with making out these agreements to basically transfer or acknowledge uh, Oklahoma as having jurisdiction over these people for crimes committed on Indian land. But there are other tribes that don't want to give up jurisdiction that they had been denied for generations. So instead of signing agreements with the state of Oklahoma, they are hiring more attorneys more prosecutors, more public defenders. Uh, they are making contracts for um, prison beds uh, and jail space. Um, so it really depends on the tribe. There is no uh, right or wrong approach. It depends on each tribe's circumstances, how they want to deal with this decision. But at the end of the day, it is a very positive decision from a tribal point of view. Um, and it's very significant and it's going to, I think, have repercussions well into the future, not just in Oklahoma, but maybe in other states. Um, maybe other convicts will, or, or convicted individuals, I should say, um, will be challenging their state convictions, um, you know, citing a lack of legal authority to disestablish um, a reservation. Um, one, one interesting thing that I found out in preparing for this presentation was uh, because the decision, even though it, it was mostly based on criminal law, it did come out in favor of Indian country for the Muscogee Creek Nation. Well, Indian country is not only a standard in criminal cases, it's also a standard in taxation cases. So there are... Um, federal and uh, state, well, I shouldn't say federal, there are state tax exemptions available for Indians who live and earn money in Indian country. And this is an issue that has been litigated, you know, multiple times over the years, especially in California, where we have small reservations that aren't big enough to accommodate tribal members. Uh, you know, I know a reservation in Riverside County that's only big enough for its casino and its parking lot, but tribal members cannot actually live there because there's no housing space. But after the McGirt decision, we started to see more and more Native Americans, uh, tribal members who are living on Muscogee Creek Nation land challenge their Oklahoma state income taxes and win. They've actually been getting refunds from the state um, government because the Supreme Court now told us that uh, they are living in Indian country. So I'm not sure how long that will continue. Um, I think the uh, government, it, our governor of Oklahoma is pretty panicked about the idea of losing more uh, tax revenue. Um, but um, it just goes to show how significant the McGirt decision really is. Um, and with that, I am all done. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I'm eager to uh, take any questions you might have.
I can't hear you, Valerie. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Okay, great, sorry about that. Okay, so the first question from one of our attendees uh, is, um, can Gors the Gorsuch language in this decision be applied to the crimes at the, our borders, i.e. illegal immigration? No laws seem to be enforced. Uh, that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting question. I, I don't really, I don't practice immigration law at all. Um, and I, I can tell you that in California, um, while the McGirt decision is significant, it um, actually, it doesn't have um, a, a lot of impact in terms of Indian reservations in the state of California, because while we did have 18 treaties negotiated with tribes in the middle of the 1800s, none of them, not a single one was ever ratified by Congress. So those reservations technically never went into existence. Um, other reservations came into being because of executive orders or acts of Congress in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, but I do think there might be some authority in this decision um, at least some compelling language um, that might focus um, the jurisdictional problems with certain criminal convictions. So I, I wish I had a better answer about that. Um, I'm just not experienced enough in immigration law. Okay. Um, our next question is, if federal and tribal concurrent jurisdiction exists, for the perpetrator being Indian and the victim being non-Indian, but there is no federal jurisdiction if the tribe has been punished, as the slide stated, how is there double jeopardy given the separate sovereigns, but there is no federal jurisdiction if the tribe has been punished? I'm confused a little bit by that language. Um, if you're the writer of this question, you, can, you know, might want to clarify, but maybe you have a better insight on it, Mark. So, um, you know, it, it is a complicated issue. So basically, maybe the easiest way I can say it is concurrent jurisdiction always exists when it comes to crimes committed in Indian country. Um, a tribe will always have criminal jurisdiction over Indians who commit crimes in Indian country, including their members, but also members of other tribes. Now, there is always is also going to be concurrent jurisdiction with either the state or the federal government. The federal government has criminal jurisdiction over Indians who commit what are called major crimes. And these are serious crimes, obviously. I think there are 16 enumerated crimes such as rape, murder, arson, assault, um, except in states that have public law 280 jurisdiction like California. So it's either going to be one or the other state or uh, federal criminal jurisdiction on that Indian land. Um, but what you see happening, it's not so much an issue in Oklahoma as it would be in California. But like I said, none of the tribes I work with here in California are currently exercising criminal jurisdiction. So they leave it up to the state government because the state has the resources to try and convict and incarcerate um, people convicted of crimes. Most of the tribes in California do not have those resources. Um, so if, if that person, Valerie, um, clarifies the question, I'll be happy to, to take it. Great. Again. So I had some questions, sure. <laughs> of course. Um, so. I'm, you talk a lot about public law 280 and how it gives jurisdiction um, to the states for crimes that have been committed on Indian territories and, and Indian country. Um, it, I noticed Oklahoma is a, a state with a lot of uh, Native population, Native American people. Are the states that have signed on to public law 280 tend to be states with smaller tribal populations or um, like what determines who decided to, to participate or was it determined by the legislature? That's a really good question and I'm glad you asked it. So when Public Law 280 was passed by Congress in 1953, uh, Congress actually mandated that five states um, get Public Law 280 jurisdiction. 
uh, California was one, Oregon, Minnesota, Nebraska, and I think Wisconsin. Um, Alaska was uh, the last state to get public law 280 jurisdiction because it wasn't yet a state in 1953. Um, so those states didn't have a choice in getting this jurisdiction. And I, on one hand, I could see why states would want this power because it, it eliminates kind of jurisdictional gaps. But on the other hand, public law 280 in the law says that the states cannot tax Indian lands. So basically they're gonna have to make, they, they're gonna have to live with more work with less revenue or no additional revenue. Um, but after 1968, or actually after 1953, states could opt into public law 280 jurisdiction if they wanted to. But that would be with the understanding that they would have a lot more responsibility without the ability to tax those people or those lands. Um, and I do think those mandatory states um, had significant Native American populations, but I, um, I think it was probably a mixture of um, the federal government trying to look at what it could unload on states. And also maybe some of those states probably wanted this expanded power. Um, California has a very large Native American population, but that's mostly due, I think, to an influx of Native American people from other states in the 1950s and 60s as part of a, a relocation program. So, and I had one other question and um, please, if you have questions, help me out here. Um, but uh, what I was wondering is, um, you know, most of our Supreme Court justices are from east of the Mississippi. Yes. Do you think that this case um, kind of highlights that we need to have more uh, geographic diversity on the Supreme Court um, because many of the justices may not have really even dealt with um, Indian law cases previously? You know, I think, um, I think this case could be uh, kind of signaling that need for, for di more diversity and change. Um, you know, I, I was kind of focused on Justice uh, Gorsuch as coming from the 10th Circuit and having seen a lot of um, Indian law cases uh, during his tenure there. But um, I think it's very interesting. We do have a lot of East Coasters um, on the uh, Supreme Court, people who were born and raised there or certainly went to school there. Um, but I think the, the Biden administration at least has stated uh, a commitment to kind of diversify the federal judiciary. So I don't know if, if that's only in terms of uh, racial and gender makeup or, or also geographic um, uh, locations and origins, but you know, I, I think that I think that the McGirt decision could signal that need for change um, because the majority opinion I think is just very nuanced you know i read it thinking this is somebody who gets it and four other justices agreed with him and i'm not sure closure, i'm from the east coast originally so no hate as as is mark we i didn't mean to call you out valerie but uh, <laughs> yes we were talking about that before the um presentations so, okay so here we go we we um back <clears throat> to our our previous uh question um the uh, attendee asks this the slide stated that there is concurrent federal and tribal jurisdiction but no federal jurisdiction if, if the tribe has been punished can you give an example to illustrate when the tribe has been punished such that there is no federal jurisdiction thanks uh sure i can do that and this is actually um something that i've seen as a tribal court judge i i the tribe did not exercise jurisdiction in this situation, but there could be a low level crime committed on the Paula reservation where I'm, I'm the judge, the tribal court judge, um, by a Paula tribal member on Paula tribal land. And that is something that would probably only be within the tribe's jurisdiction. Um, I, think, I think the state probably could, if it was a low level crime, the state probably technically would have jurisdiction, but you know 
my understanding from the district attorneys that I that I work with is that they're swamped. Um, you know, sometimes it is hard to get them to prosecute a low level crime um, in Indian country. And that's unfortunate because um, tribes have an interest in maintaining the peace and safety of their communities for their members and their visitors and their guests. Um, but some things just frankly don't rise to that level, but the tribe could exercise jurisdiction in that scenario um, and dispense with it. It's just that um, none of the tribes I work with are currently exercising that criminal jurisdiction because it triggers a whole bunch of other due process uh, rights which are required and basically desirable, but um, also expensive. Um, you know, when I go to tribal court, um, every tribal court I've worked in, and I've worked in several throughout the state, um, guarantees individuals the right to have an attorney present, um, but none of them appoint an attorney. That's a big distinction between tribal courts and state courts, at least in terms of criminal and um, dependency law. Well, I think that's all of our questions. Um, and we just hit the one o'clock mark. So uh, oh, that's timing. good timing. Um, and, and if you, you know, this might bring up that we might need to have you back to talk about jurisdiction, jurisdictional issues in, with federal Indian reservations and the law. So um, thank you again, Mark, for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you to all of our attendees who are with us here today. We are so happy to have you. When this um, webinar ends, you will be automatically redirected to a survey to tell us what you thought about this webinar. We would really appreciate it if you take a few minutes to do that survey um, and let you let us know what you think. And um, if you want to have more classes like this, please feel free to email us at refdesk, which is R-E-F-D-E-S-K at sdlawlibrary.org and let us know if you have um, any suggestions for us. So. Thank you again, Mark. We are so happy to have you um, and I'll give you the last word. Thank you, Valerie. It was an honor to be here. I look forward to you know more classes in the future as a guest and maybe a presenter um, and stay well. Thank you all. Have a good day.